Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to AOS again. So today's lecture is going to be on multiprocessor operating systems. Before I start on that, a little bit about me. Uh, you probably haven't seen me before. So my name is Ihor. I'm an OS engineer at a company called Crichton and working on building an SEL4-based OS and platform for uh, connected devices, industrial connected devices. And before that, I spent a good 18 years here at UNSW at NICTA Data61 in the Trustworthy Systems Group uh, working on SEL4 and software on top of SEL4 and so on. Before that, I did a PhD in distributed systems. And sometime in those you know, 20, 25 years, I also did a year-long sabbatical in Zurich working on the Barrelfish uh, multi-core operating system. So I got a bit of a background in, obviously, OS, um, but also the relevant things for multiprocessor OSs, which is working on specific multi-core operating systems, but also working on distributed systems. And as we'll see soon, modern computers, modern processors, and so on, start looking a lot like distributed systems. And so when we start looking at multi-core, multi-core, multiprocessor operating systems, we'll start looking at a lot of distributed systems issues. And I also used to teach distributed systems here at UNSW for a long time. So all of that kind of combines together to let us talk about multi-core operating systems. So a bit of an overview of, of this lecture. This is going to be two lectures today and on Thursday. We're going to start with looking at what a multi-core, multiprocessor OS is. So a bit of a background and reminder about how it works and what some of the scalability problems are of that. And then... In order to understand some of the complexities and some of the things we need to do to build good multiprocessor OSs, we're going to look at the hardware. So what hardware do these things actually run on? And it turns out that it's not as simple as just a machine with a bunch of processors or cores. There are a whole bunch of different issues that affect how you might design and build the operating systems that run on this. So we'll spend a bunch of time looking at various hardware. We'll look at contemporary hardware, stuff you can buy now off the shelf, as well as stuff that's experimental, uh, things that people have done in the past experimenting. And a lot of the features you'll see from the experimental hardware kind of trickle in to contemporary hardware. So a lot of the contemporary hardware looks like the experimental hardware of the past. So we'll look at a lot of those. And then we'll talk about how to actually design the operating system to run on one of these multiprocessors. So what are some of the challenges? What are some of the guidelines? So what, what do you need to take into account and remember when doing this? We'll look at a lot of different design approaches from the past, both from academia and industry. Um, things like divide and conquer. So you've got a bunch of processors. You divide them into smaller parts and run smaller parts of systems on them. We'll look at ways to reduce sharing. So it turns out that sharing, you probably know this already, is one of the big challenges in doing anything in parallel and likewise in a multi-core operating system. And so we'll look at different approaches that have been done in the past for reducing the sharing in the operating systems. And then we'll look at more radical approaches like no sharing at all, so not having any kind of shared data structures and so on in the operating system. This is where things like Barrelfish come in. Today, we're mainly going to focus on the first two parts. So what is a multiprocessor OS and what is multiprocessor hardware? And then on thur Thursday, we're going to look at the OS design. So you're probably familiar with this. Uh, this is how, at a very high level, a uniprocessor operating system works. So we start off here. We've got kind of a single CPU, and it's got some code that it's going to run, which is going to be either application code or operating system code. And then we've got the memory of the system. And the memory contains a bunch of data. It's going to contain a bunch of application data, so data that the application is using. And then it's going to contain a bunch of operating system data. So things like the run queue of the operating system, things like process control blocks and so on, things like file system structures, etc. So when you're running on a uniprocessor, what essentially happens is you may be running an app. And so the application is running in user mode. It's running and it's accessing some of its application memory. So the data, application data in memory. And then at some point, it switches to run OS code. So for example, the application might invoke a system call to access a file. And so the operating system code for accessing the file is going to run. And it's going to access some OS data in memory. And then when that finishes, it's going to go back to the application. It's going to run uh, access application data. And then at some point, 
the timer might go off and it's time to, to schedule a new application. So the OS is going to access the run queue. And then uh, a new application will start running. And that application is going to access its own data and so on and so on. So that's pretty straightforward. Now, if we move to a multiprocessor OS, the basic model is that we've got a bunch of CPUs all accessing the same memory. And then each CPU is going to be running either application code or operating system code. And when it's running application code, it's going to be accessing application data. And when it's running operating system code, it's going to be accessing operating system data. So as an example, we've got each CPU is running application code. And so it's accessing application data. The first thing we notice here is that there is potentially a problem because we've got CPU, uh, let's call it CPU 3 and CPU 4, are all running application 4, and they're accessing application 4 data at the same time. So we're familiar with this problem. If they're accessing shared data at the same time, you might get corruption, you might get problems, and so you need to do something special to take care of that. Now, if we keep running, at some point, one of the CPUs might start running operating system code, accessing OS data, uh, back to its application. Another CPU might run OS code, accessing OS data. And then what happens if another CPU goes to the operating system as well and starts accessing the, the OS data? You get the same problem as you did when multiple applications were running at the same time on different CPUs. Now the different instances of the OS running on different CPUs are accessing the same OS data. And so we get that same problem of shared data. Um, and so this is kind of the fundamental of multiprocessor operating systems. The key challenges are that we need to have correctness of the shared data. So we need to make sure that we don't get the, the kind of race conditions that will corrupt your data. The two different processors are writing to the same data item and corrupt that data item. But we also need to get scalability. So we know how to pr protect against the correctness problems. We can use locks, for example. And so if, we, if the OS is trying to write to the file system structure on, on one CPU, it can lock that structure so that the OS code on another CPU can't access that and corrupt that. So we know how to do that, but using locks and so on can prevent scalability, can have problems with scalability. And I'll talk about scalability in a sec, but what we want to make sure is that in solving the correctness problem, we don't want the performance to suffer. Um, and so we need to have a solution that's also scalable. So looking at the correctness of shared data, we, there are a bunch of different techniques for doing concurrency control. And you're familiar with those. You've had lectures on, on you know, quite deep involved lectures on, on the various approaches. So I won't go into details with those. But things like locks, things like semaphores, using transactions or hardware supported transactions, using lock free data structures and so on just to ensure that when multiple different code running concurrently, so running on different CPUs, accessing that data, that they don't all try to access it at the same time, that there's some kind of ordering, some kind of logic that makes sure that they're accessed in a, in a reasonable way and don't corrupt that data. And we know how to do this. We know how to do this in applications. And we have a lot of experience in doing that in operating systems. Right? You stick locks on everything. You can, you can go from kind of a big lock around the operating system where every time you go into the OS code, there's a lock so that no other OS code can run at the same time to much more fine-grained locking where you're really only locking around the actual data structures that you're accessing. So whenever there's kind of explicit access to shared data, we know how to deal with that. Um, so the other aspect is the speed up. So what do we mean by speed up? Well, with multiprocessor systems, the idea is that as you add more processors, the system should run faster. And that's the whole idea of adding more processors. You can do more at the same time, and so the system should run faster. So ideally, what you get is as you, this kind of linear relationship, as you add more processors, the speed of the whole system increases linearly as well. And so we have this formula, speed up is basically the time it takes to perform a task or, or, or do some kind of job on one processor divided by the time it takes to do it on multiple processors. Um, and then that should increase. Unfortunately, in real life, what happens is more something like this. So ideally, you'd want this faint line 
increasing linear, linearly. But what happens is, as you add more processors, you get some speed up, but it's not linear. And at some point, it doesn't make sense to add more processors because you're not going to be getting that speed up anymore. Why does that happen? So here, here's kind of a, a simple example of, of why that happens. If you have a program that you want to run in parallel, you can basically think of that program as having a bunch of code that can be run in parallel and then having some code that can't be run in parallel. So we call that serial code and then more code that's run in parallel. Now, if you're trying to run that on multiple processors, here's an example of what happens. So you run all the code on three processors in parallel, and that goes quickly because it's run in parallel. So it's not four, three times four long. It's just four long. But then when you run the serial code, that can only run on one processor at a time. So you run it on processor one, and then you run it on processor two, and then you run it on processor three, and then you can run all the parallel code again. And so this serial bit really slows things down. And it turns out that the more serial code you have, the slower things get. So again, another example, if we didn't have any serial code, it would be very fast. If we had a little bit of serial code, it would be slower. But if we had a lot more serial code, it would be even more slower. And as you add serial code, it gets slower and slower and slower. So this is reflected in Amdahl's law. So you've seen this before as well. And this is basically showing you what the limits of scalability are based on how much, how, what percentage of your code is serial code. And so we see you know, this green line up top says there's 95% of code is parallel code. So there's only 5% of code is serial code. And so you get pretty good speed up. But eventually, you know, we've got like 248, 490, 4, 2048, 4096 processors. Eventually, it stops. But not only does it eventually stop, if you look at it, we've got like 4,000 4K processors, but the speed up is only 20 times. Right? So it's only 20 times faster than it would be on a single core, but you're using 4,000 cores or processors for that. So that's not really great. So Amdahl's law shows this really nicely. It's also a really you know, kind of a horrible thing if you're trying to do parallel processing, if you're trying to do multiprocessing, because it gives you kind of a hard limit to what you can do. But what it also tells us is that we need to try to reduce the serial part of our code as much as possible. And so remember, serialization comes, for example, if you do a lock. Right? If you're running your code and you lock it and then run your code so that no other processors can be running the same code, then that's essentially serial code. And so you're really preventing other code from running in parallel while you're doing that. And so you want to reduce that as much as possible. So where does the serialization come from? Well, one of the things I mentioned is it can come from the application. So if the application is written to be a parallel application and it knows that there are some parts of the code that need to be serial, then, um, then that's going to introduce serial code. But it can also come from the operating system. So as we saw in the example of the multiprocessor OS, if OS's code is running and it's running on multiple cores and it's accessing shared OS data, then you also have to have serialization there. So the OS might also have locks and do serialization there. Uh, so well, one of the questions then is how important is that, right? How much time is actually spent in the OS and does it really matter if the applications on top of the US are OS are all parallel? Well, it doesn't even have to be that much time spent in that because if you look at Amdahl's law, it doesn't have to be a large percentage of the code that's being run to have a significant impact on the speed up. So even if it wasn't very much code, very much time being spent in the OS, it's still going to have an impact on the speed up on multiple processors. So more, more specifically, sources of serialization, we can have explicit sources of serialization. And so this is when you're doing your locking. And so every time you do a lock, every time you have some kind of critical section, you're introducing serialization to your code. So when you're waiting for a lock, you're going to stall yourself. You're not doing any work. And so any parallel aspects of you are not going to be doing that work either. So fundamentally, locking introduces serialization because that's what it does. But also the implementation of a lock can introduce serialization as well. So for example, if you implement your lock with atomic operations, 
then those operations are going to lock the bus. And so anyone waiting for memory is potentially going to be stalled as well. So they don't necessarily have to be trying to run the same critical section as you, but that implementation may stall others as well. So that's introducing some serialization. There's cache coherence traffic, uh, which loads the bus. So there's a lot of traffic that's kind of implemented by the hardware in order to maintain coherence in caches, which we'll talk about later. That introduces traffic to the bus, so that's going to slow other traffic on the bus as well. So uh, others that are waiting for memory and so on are going to be slowed down as well, and that is a form of serialization as well. So there's some impl um, implicit serialization in the implementation of the lock. Any memory access is implicit serialization. So there's relatively high latency access to memory. So if you're trying to access memory, you're going to stall yourself, which means you're not running in parallel with other code. And so there's some serialization going on there. And then there's caches as well that are, are a big source of implicit serialization. So when you try to access memory, there's this whole cache hierarchy, and you've learned about caches as well. The process is potentially going to be stalled. The processor is potentially going to be stalled as it's implementing cache coherency, as it's getting memory to be put into the caches and so on. And so if the processes are stalled there, nothing's running, and that's implicitly a source of serialization as well. How bad that is depends on the latency of the interconnect. So when we have multiple processors, they're connected together through what's called an interconnect. And if that interconnect is slower, then the impact of, of the cache coherency and so on is going to be larger. So that affects it as well. And then the performance also depends on things like data size, like cache lines and the contention of the cache, so how many cores are using it and so on. So all of these things combine together to impact the serialization as well. So the main thing here is there's explicit sources of serialization that everyone thinks about when we talk about this, but there are a whole bunch of implicit sources of serialization that are related to how the processors work and how they're implemented that we don't necessarily take into account, but that we have to take into account when dealing with, uh, when trying to design and build multiprocessor operating systems. Um, so cache, uh, interestingly enough, caches are there to speed things up, to make it, make it faster to access memory and stuff. Uh, unfortunately, they're also like a source of a lot of problems when dealing with um, concurrency and so on, when, when trying to build fast performing systems. So other, other sources of cache related serialization, things like false sharing. So when you have unrelated data structures that share a cache line, those can be sources of serialization. So different processor, processors, processors access different data structures, but because they happen to be sharing a cache line, you suffer those um, cache related perform penalties or serialization penalties because suddenly you're waiting for the cache coherency to happen before you can access your data because some other processor is ac accessing it as well. And suddenly you can't run, and that's serialization. Things like cache line bouncing. So um, basically sharing the memory between many processors means that the line, the cache data is going to be sent between the various caches on the various processors. Again, that takes time. Right? The hardware has to implement that and do all the copying and so on, and that's going to cause serialization as well. So if you're trying to access some memory and it needs to come from a cache on, on a different part of the pro or on, on a different core in the processor, then you're going to have to wait for that memory to be there. And again, you're doing nothing, so that's a source of serialization. You're not running parallel code when that's happening. Um, and then cache misses. Obviously, if you're trying to access data and it's not in your cache, then it's going to have to be got, take, gotten from other caches or from memory and so on, and that's going to cause you to do nothing as well, and that's going to cause serialization as well. Um, so interesting aspect is, okay, let's think about cache misses. When, when do cache misses occur? Well, obviously, if an application is accessing data for the first time, it's not going to be in its cache, so there's going to be a cache miss there. That's pretty obvious. If an application is running on a new core, you might, you're, you're going to get a bunch of cache misses there. So for example, if the co code has just been loaded on a new core, application is running there, it's accessing memory, the, the cache on that core is not going to have that data. So you're going to have cache misses, even if that application has been running for a long time before on other cores. Um, and then obviously, you get cache misses when cache memory has been evicted. So 
if it was in the cache, but for some reason other processes or other programs needed that cache memory, the cache lines, it gets evicted and it needs to be loaded back in. Um, so when does that happen? Well, the obvious time when that happens is when your cache footprint is too big, so you're just kind of getting in your own way for the cache. But it also happens if another application has been running. So you're running for a while, you build up your cache, another application runs and it just throws everything out of your cache and runs again. But also if the OS is running, right? So the OS loads up, it can potentially throw out stuff that the application had in the cache and then when the application is scheduled again, it has to start bringing stuff back in. So there are a bunch of cases where you can't really do much about it because it's up to the application and what the footprint is. But in other cases, if other apps are running or if the OS is running or even managing which core an application runs on can help improve the scalability, can reduce serialization of cache misses and so on. There was a, an, an interesting kind of anecdote for, um, I guess this was around 2010. We were, we were working on multi-core operating systems. We were testing things on, on Linux and, uh, and running this program, and we were seeing like really strange behavior. Everything was really slow for some reason. And we figured out that the way the Linux scheduling worked for a long time was that every time it rescheduled an application, it would schedule it on a new core. So it would run for a while on one core, then get scheduled out, and it would, when it got rescheduled, it'd be scheduled on a new core. And that way it had nothing in the cache, and so it would suffer all of, all of these cache misses. And the next time it was scheduled, it'd be run on a new core again, and so on. That was really strange. I think they fixed that now. Uh, but it, it's kind of an example of how relatively simple OS decisions can have a big impact on the performance of, of your applications and the whole system. Right? Just a simple decision of you know, what core to schedule an application on when it's, or a process on when it's rescheduled can have a big impact on performance because of these kind of things. So that was kind of a bit of an introduction to what some of the main challenges are when, when looking at multiprocessor operating systems. And so the main thing here is we need to deal with concurrent access to memory, and we need to do that efficiently. And in order to do that efficiently, we need to manage explicit serialization, but also implicit serialization, like dealing with caches, um, shared memory, uh, implementation of locks and, and things like that. So developing a good multiprocessor operating system is all about dealing with those things. But in order to be able to really deal with those things, in order to really understand how to build operating systems that can deal with that, we need to understand how the hardware actually works and what kind of problems the hardware can introduce that potentially involve serialization. So what I want to do now is look at some examples of multiprocessor hardware so that we understand what we're talking about, how these things work, and then we'll look at, well, how do we build OSs that actually run on this stuff? So before I look at actual examples, some terminology. So multi-what? Um, if, if, if you kind of look at industry and the literature and so on, there's a lot of terminology being thrown around when talking about multiprocessors. And so it's good to kind of clarify uh, what we're talking about. So, there's a little picture there that kind of shows what we're talking about. There's basically three levels that we're talking about when we're talking about multiprocessors. So we've got kind of the package level, uh, which can also be called the CPU, can be called the processor, can be called the module. And this is the thing that you plug into your motherboard. Right? This is like you know, the package that's got, you know, well, nowadays they've got little ball pins and stuff you can plug in. Um, and then we've got the die level. And so the die is basically kind of, you know, the, the, the silicon wafer part. Um, and then we've got the actual core itself. And so the core is what's actually doing the work, right? What's got the ALUs and so on, the, the actual processor. And what we typically have is we have multiple cores on a single die, and then we potentially have multiple dies in a single package or on a single processor. And then we often have multiple processors on, on a motherboard or in a computer. And so we've got multi at various different levels. And so these all have different names. So when we're talking about multiprocessors, this is often also called SMP. This is when we've got actual multiple packages on a motherboard. Sometimes there are separate motherboards even. 
And these are connected through some kind of internet, interconnect between processors. We can talk about multi-threads. So these are hardware threads within a core. Um, this isn't real parallelism. It's kind of pseudo-parallelism. Uh, we can talk about multi-cores. So this is chip multiprocessing. Um, so this is where we have multiple cores on a die. And then we can have kind of multi-core plus multiprocessor, where we can have multiple dies on a processor, and then we can have multiple processors on a motherboard, for example. And so we can have kind of multiprocessing, multi-core multi at all these various levels at the same time, potentially. Um, so generally, in, in this lecture, unless I'm talking about specifics, if I talk about multi-core or multiprocessor, I generally mean the same thing, just that there are a lot of cores running. But the details of where those cores are, how they communicate, how they're set up together, is actually really important for understanding the consequences when you're building an operating system. And then another thing that you might often see is this term many core. So it's kind of multi-core and many core. And many core is generally used when we're talking about lots of cores. So typically over 100, over 50, over 100 cores on a computer. And then we start talking about many cores. Because once we start getting to many cores, the, the issues are often different or are often magnified. So compared to running on a processor with, say, four cores or eight cores, when you're running on a processor with 100 cores, a lot of the issues like cache management, like interconnect, like latency, and so on, are magnified. And so there's this kind of separate term of many core. But the main thing to understand is there's you know, various kind of levels of maltiness. And unless it's relevant to what we're talking about, I'll be using a lot of the terms interchangeably. So I'm, I'm going to talk about a whole bunch of different kind of hardware as we go through. And this is basically just kind of a list and a summary of some of the hardware I talk about. So for contemporary systems, I'm going to talk about Intel systems. I'm going to talk about some AMD systems. I'll talk a little bit about um, Oracle UltraSparks, even though those kind of are not used anymore. And I'll talk about ARM systems. Right? So this represents kind of what you can go out and buy, what's running in your systems now, in your computers now. So if you were to build an OS for contemporary si machines, you know, these are the kind of things you'd be using. And I'll sprinkle in some kind of experimental or non-mainstream multiprocessor systems as well. So these are systems that have been developed either in academia or in industry as experiments sometimes. So someone has an idea of how to do things, they develop these things, they run experiments with them, or as kind of just commercial products but that are not targeted at mainstream kind of, you know, your desktop, laptop, mobile computing, but potentially at, uh, at more niche things like high performance computing or network routing or network computing and so on. Um, so these are things like, you know, Beehive was an experiment, is a research project. Tylera was a commercial project that's kind of gone into um, a lot of kind of network processing equipment. Polaris was an Intel research project. SEC, single chip cloud computer, was a research project. And then uh, Intel Mix, so was a, was a commercial project. Um, kind of a, an accelerator, the Xeon Phi and so on. So I'll talk about those as well. And these are, these are the things that you won't be typically running on your desktops or laptops. You won't typically be going out and buying them. Some of them are not even available. But a lot of them have ideas and experimental ideas that have kind of trickled into the mainstream contemporary hardware. And we'll see examples of that. Um, so... As we go through and talk about the various hardware, the various multiprocessors, I'm going to structure it by looking at interesting properties of these multiprocessors. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the scale and the structure. So how many processors, how many cores do we actually have, are we talking about? And how are they structured? Where are they placed relative to each other? Where are they placed on the, pro on the, on the die? or in the, in the processor, or even on the motherboard, for example. So different kind of systems make different decisions about where and how to place these things. Um, another aspect of scale and structure is what kinds of processors are there? Are they homogenous? Are they just all the same? Is it the same core? Or is it heterogeneous? Are there different cores? Um, potentially even different hardware architectures 
that are used in a system. So we'll look at examples of those. Uh, then we'll look at memory locality. So where is the memory located? I think it's act this might actually be switched around. The order on this slide might not be quite correct. But it's important to understand where is the memory located in relation to these processing cores. Right? Where, how far away is the memory from specific cores? Is it, are they all equidistant or are, are some cl cores closer to the memory than others? We'll look at caches. So the cache architecture is very important uh, for these multi-cores. So what are the caches? What kind of caches are there? How do they work? Um, what, what about cache coherence? Do, do the systems provide hardware cache coherence? How expensive is that? And then we'll look at interconnects. So how are the cores actually connected together? So this is important. Um, it's important to understand how they're connected together, what the latency is of the interconnects, but also how uniform the, the latency is between cores. Does it take an equal amount of time to send or fetch data from every other core, or are some cores closer than others? And it takes less time to get to some cores and more time to get to others. And then we'll quickly look at interprocessor inter communication. What are some options for interprocessor communication? Um, can they actually send messages, explicitly send messages to each other or not? So we'll start with scale and structure, and we'll start with something uh, relatively simple. So if we look at like a Cortex-A9 and P-Core, this is a basic kind of multi-core structure. Right? We've got one processor, and this processor has four cores. And each core, so this is on a single die, each core has L1 cache on it. Um, the cores are homogenous, so they're all the same. And then there's potentially also L2 cache. There's a whole bunch of kind of functionality, a whole bunch of hardware real estate that's used for cache management functionality. So in order to make sure that the caches are coherent on the core, there's a whole bunch of functionality here. There's functionality for um, accessing I.O. Um, and then accessing uh, memory as well. And then there's this, I'll talk about this later, this accelerator coherency port, which is about coherency with, with I.O. devices as well. But this is kind of what a lot of people think about or think of when, when you talk about multi-core, right? This is kind of what a basic multi-core system works like. Just a bunch of cores, each with their own L1 cache, and then potentially a shared L2 cache, and a bunch of mechanism to make sure that the caches are coherent. We can go much more complex than that. So this is an example of Intel and Halem, where we've got the multiplot processor and multi-core. So here we've actually got a bunch of processors in the machine. And then each processor has some dies, and each die has some cores. So this, this kind of has that whole hierarchy there. Um, so we've got a couple of cores here. Each of those cores have their own um, L1 and L2 caches. And then each of these processors have a shared L3 cache. And then in between the processors, there's an interconnect as well. So this is much more complex. Now we've got you know, not just kind of the simple multi-core, but now we've got a bunch of processors and a bunch of dies and a bunch of cores as well. So things get a lot more complicated there. Another option is to have what's called a tile. So this is an example of a many core machine. Right? The idea here is that you can have a lot of cores, so more than 50, more than 100. And so we've got you know, all these, each of these little gray boxes is a processing core. And then we'll see that you know, in order for that to work, we have to really pay attention to the interconnect for the communication between the cores. But the main thing here is that we've got lots of cores the cores are not necessarily as powerful as you would have on, you know, like a Intel, like dual or, or quad core or something like that, right? They're probably a lot weaker, but there's a lot more potential parallelism going on if you've got this kind of tile architecture, right? This kind of many core system. So this is an example of a commercial system from Tylera, Tile64, and that went through several iterations, um, improving the technology and so on. And then, again, 
in, in both of these cases, or in all of these cases so far, we've been talking about a homogeneous architecture, right? All of these cores are the same. So if you've got some code that's running in the system, you can run it on any of these cores, and, and it should run the same. Modulo caching and memory access and so on. And the same is true on, the, on this kind of tile system. Right? So you've got the same code can run on all of these. And so you can have you know, instances of the same operating system running on all of them, and they can schedule things. Uh, the interesting thing with this is that you can kind of either use it as, as, as a single big multi-core computer where you've got you know, the same operating system essentially scheduling everything, or you can potentially partition it and have you know, separate independent instances of the operating system running on different parts of the system as well. But the point is, these were all kind of homogeneous systems. But you can also have heterogeneous systems, right? So an example of that is the ARM big little architecture. So the idea here is that we have um, a, a set of cores, which are kind of your performance cores, and then a set of cores that are, are weaker, but potentially use less energy, right? And so if you want to run you know, kind of code that requires a lot of computation and so on, you'd want to schedule these cores. And if you want to save energy, you don't have much to run. The code doesn't need to run fast, doesn't need to use much, doesn't need, require much performance. Then you can run it on these weaker cores. And so the big little architecture kind of provides you with these different cores, right? They're, they're still the, the same basic architecture, right? They say still use the same instruction set, so you can run the same code on them, but they have different properties, right? So in particular, kind of the performance uh, is different. And so with ARM Big Little, it provides you with these kind of, in this case, two cores and two cores, and you can set up the system in different ways, right? You can set it up as either these, the weaker cores shadow the, the bigger cores, so you can either turn the big ones on and the weak ones off, or the big ones off and the weak ones on. Um, or in some cases, you can have all of them running as well. And so if your operating system needs to understand these differences in order to do appropriate, you know, appropriately manipulate the processor, right? It needs to understand that you know, if, if you need the performance, you need to run on these big cores. If you want to save power and so on, you can run on the little cores. Potentially, if you've got a lot of work to do, you might want to use all the cores, but you need to then schedule accordingly. Um, but the thing is, the operating system needs to understand that it's running on this kind of system, potentially. And then um, this got kind of expanded by, um, by, by the dynamic, um, so the next kind of generation of the big little architecture, which allowed for a lot more flexibility in what you're doing. So with, with big little, it was really kind of, you know, you had a couple of preset configurations that the processor could be in with regards to the process, with regards to the kind of the weak and, and, and the strong processors. Whereas with dynamic, there were a lot more options for how you could run things. So you could have situations where you've got you know a bunch of little cores and a big core running at the same time, or even more little cores and a big core, and, and so you kind of choose um, have a lot more flexibility, right? And and with that flexibility means that software needs to make a lot more choices as well. So again. It's important to understand what you're running on to determine how to effectively use that hardware and schedule things. And then with, with heterogeneous cores again, if you look at modern system on a chips, um, you know, these are kind of chips that have your application processors, but they have a whole bunch of other system elements on, on the chip as well, right? Like the memory controllers, they have a bunch of I.O. controllers, a bunch of I.O. devices on board and stuff like that. Well, if you look at modern ones, then what we notice is that, um, that they actually have a whole bunch of different processors on them. So all of these kind of circled things are, are different processors. So at the top left, we kind of have our main application cores. Right? These, are, these are the things that we run the operating system on and, and it schedules our application code. But we also have, um, you know, here kind of on, on, on the bottom left, we've got a bunch of Cortex-R5s, which are much weaker kind of microcontroller type processors. So they don't have 
as, as many features. They're not as, as powerful as the application process. But these are also processors that also run their own code and, and can potentially be controlled. We have up in the top right another Cortex R5 that's responsible for various I.O. We've got um, a GPU, which is essentially you know, um, also a processor that can run code. Um, we've got you know, some, some security processors here as well at the bottom right, which also run code. And the interesting thing here is that not only do all of these things run code, but they also have access to memory. Right? So all of these different processors have access to memory they may have different views of that memory. So your main processor may see you know, a particular address space. The other processors may see that memory as a different kind of address space. They may have different addresses, so different ways of referring to that same memory element. Um, they may have different rules about who can access what. So in our application processors, we have the memory management unit. And that determines, you know, which processes, for example, can access which memory, how you're mapping that memory into virtual memory and so on. It provides some memory protections, right? We also have typically a system, mem um, system memory management unit, so, so system MMU, system memory management unit, which often, de which determines how I.O. devices can access memory. So, for example, if an I.O. device can do DMA, it determines which memory it can access as well. But then we have these you know, other processors that also access the memory. They may not be protected by the application processor MMU, for example, or even the system MMU necessarily. Or when they are, the, the addresses that you need to talk about them accessing might not be the same one as on the, on the application processor. So things become really complex here because not only do you have to deal with kind of multi-core up there, in your application processor, but now you've got all these other essentially independent almost processors that do completely different things, but that still access the same memory. And so someone needs to man manage that as well. And these are also very heterogeneous, right? These R5s are, are quite different from the application processors, which are different from the GPUs, which is going to be different from the security processors and so on. And so this is a, a new aspect of kind of multi-processor, multi-core um, systems where we not only just have like your traditional kind of, you know, multiple cores on a die in a package, multiple processors that are all kind of the same. Now we've got all sorts of really different processors on our computers. So then we have a quick look at memory locality. Um, again, in, in our mind, when we think of like a regular processor, we typically think of you know, we've got, your, we've got our cores, they're all set up nicely, and then in our picture there's usually like a nice layer of memory underneath, right? So if you think back to, to the picture I had at the beginning of the multiprocessor OS, we had the CPUs up top, we had a bus, and then everything was in the same memory. That's how things are on, on relatively simple processors, but that's not how things are generally implemented on processor with a lot of cores and a lot of processors. There, we typically see non-uniform memory access. And so what non-uniform memory access means is that in this example, each of these processors have a bunch of memory that they're directly connected to. And so if they need to access something in the memory they're directly connected to, that's relatively quick. But if they need to access something in memory on, that is connected to any of the other processors, then it needs to actually communicate over the interconnect to those other processors and get the memory from there and send it back. And so what that means is that not all memory is equal. Right? Some memory is fast to get to, some memory is slower to get to. And that's what non-uniform memory access means. The memory accesses are not uniform. Some are faster, some are slower. And it's very important to understand whether you're working on a NUMA type machine or not because then you need to make decisions about where you're going to allocate your memory. So if you've got a process running on you know, this bottom left processor, for example, you need to make sure that you're allocating memory that's going to be in the directly connected memory as much as possible. Because otherwise, you're going to be spending a lot more time accessing the memory. And remember, every time you're kind of stalled waiting for a memory access, if it's going to take a long time, that introduces serialization. 
and so you're going to slow down your overall system. So you want to reduce accesses to the far away memory as much as possible. You want to stay with close by memory. So you need to understand what the memory architecture of the system you're on is. Um, and so it can be relatively simple where every, everyone has access to the same memory, or you can get these kind of NUMA architectures where everyone has access to different memory. So then, then we get to caches. Um, so this, is a, this slide is a little bit of a reminder kind of a, about some of the interesting issues of caches that are relevant for multiprocessor hardware and multiprocessor operating systems. So a reminder, we typically have uh, a cache hierarchy. So we'll have our CPU. It'll have a level one cache, and then there's a bunch of levels in between that, and then main memory. So if you try to access memory, you first look in your level one cache. If it's not there, you look in level two, you look in level three, and eventually you get to main memory. And then when you read it from main memory, depending on the types of caches, you stick it in your level three, you stick it in your level two, you stick it in your level one, and then the processor gets it. And so the idea is that you want as much as possible for the things, the memory you're accessing to be in level one, because that's quick. And the further down the hierarchy you go, the longer it takes to access anything until you get to the main memory. Um, caches can be shared or not shared. So in terms of sharing, you can have private caches. So typically, uh, so this is, for example, a cache per core. So typically, each core will have its own L1 cache. So you'll have the, the processing core and the L1 cache together. You'll have direct access to that. Other levels of caches can be directly access, can be shared or can be private, depending on the, um, the implementations. Again, accessing private caches is faster than accessing shared caches, typically. And then we can also have um, these kind of partitioned caches, where a cache is distributed and shared. So rather than having kind of a, a single L3 cache, for example, that everyone accesses, you might have slices of L3 caches. So there may be a chunk of L3 cache with each core, and every core can access that, but they're not all in the same spot. And so if, uh, you know, if core one needs to access L3 cache that's on another core, then it has to go through the interconnect uh, to actually access that. And so understanding where stuff might be in cache uh, is, is also important. Sometimes when you have the partition caches, they'll be partitioned so that specific addresses are in specific caches. Um, again, knowing that is important for how you design things, how you try to lay out your data and so on. And then a very important aspect of caches is cache coherence. So this is making sure that the values in the caches uh, are the same. Right? So you, if you have kind of the same data in the L1 of various cores, you want to make sure that that data is going to be the same. So you don't want one core to read a particular value for a particular address from its L1 cache and another core to read a different value for that address from its L1 cache. And so cache coherence makes sure that the values in the caches are consistent, right? that you don't have different values everywhere. Um, and so we can have consistency for caches at the same level. So we can talk about consistency of you know, L1 caches, for example, and make sure that they're coherent. We can also have consistency be between levels. So if you can have the same addresses in different levels of caches, they also need to be consistent with each other. So if you change something in your L1 cache, then that has to be propagated down into the value that's stored in L2 and in L3 as well. And if you start getting kind of these partitioned and shared caches, then that can start causing communication across the interconnects and so on. And then there's um, kind of the question of how the cache coherence is actually implemented, right? You can have kind of cache snooping where you're looking, where you've got hardware that's looking at what kind of cache traffic is happening and um, basically proactively acting on that to make sure that the caches are coherent. You can have things like um, directory-based caches where you have information about which caches contain which values so you can find them and so on. So the implementation, there are a lot of different implementations of cache coherence on multi-core processors. Um, so I think this is a good time to, to stop for a break. I think we've got, it's about 5.2 and it 
been told that you usually get 10 minutes break. So we'll stop for a break here, um, come back at five past, and continue talking about multiprocessor hardware. So we just looked at, um, at caches and, and some of the interesting aspects of caches for multi-core hardware and multi, multi-processor systems. So now I'm going to look at how some of these are, are actually implemented in, in various examples of multiprocessors. So we go back to kind of our, our basic system, the, the A9 MP core. Uh, as I mentioned before, we've got private L1, so it's split with um, instruction and data. It's coherent, it uses an optimized uh, messy protocol. And as I mentioned, it's implemented in the hardware. So there's like a huge chunk of the hardware that's dedicated for the various implementations of cache coherence. Um, this, this processor has an optional shared L2 cache, so you can get versions of it with an L2 cache, other ones without it. So without the L2 cache from the L1, it goes straight to memory. Um, the other thing that's important here is the processor is not the only thing that accesses memory. Right? So other, other hardware can also access the memory. In particular, any I.O. devices that have DMA will also be accessing the memory. And so the processors also need to implement cache coherence for, for those DMA-enabled devices. And so there's this kind of accelerator coherency port that helps to implement that. And so what that means is, for example, if one of the cores changes some memory value in its, in, in its, in its, in its L1 cache, then if some I.O. device tries to access that memory, it needs to know to get that value that's in the L1 cache and, and access that value or, or change it and invalidate what's, what's, what's in that cache. Otherwise, you get inconsistency between what the hardware, the I.O. devices see and what the processors see. So that's another aspect that the cache implementation needs to implement. But this is relatively basic, relatively straightforward, right? Each, each core has its own L1 cache, then it goes straight to memory. And there's some coherence implementations, and you have coherence with the I.O. devices as well. So if we go to our, our example of our much more complex architecture, well, we have more levels of cache in the hierarchy. So we've got our L1 caches, our L2 caches um, on the cores, and then the sockets, so the processors have an L3 cache, and then we have uh, cache coherence implemented also between the sockets. Right? So our, our L3 caches are coherent as well. And as I said, what it means is that you know, if, if you have kind of a miss in your L1, you get it from the L2. If you have a miss in the L2, you get it from your local L3. If it's not there, then you know, the, the kind of cache coherence goes. You might find it in another L3, or you have to go to memory. Uh, but any time kind of caches change, it has to all be propagated, and there has to be a whole bunch of communication going on between the sockets in order to make sure that everything's coherent. And so that ends up getting pretty complex as well. And so the actual implementation of cache coherence ends up taking more and more kind of footprint on, on the chip, right? It uses up space on the chip that could be used for, for, for having more cores, for example, in order to implement this cache coherence. So we'll, we'll, we'll see when we talk about kind of building and designing uh, OSs for these kind of things that if we can move to hardware that doesn't have the cache coherence in hardware, we can potentially save a lot of space and have more processors. Um, but in this case, there's kind of this, you know, many, many levels of cache and cache coherence all implemented in the processor. Uh, a slightly different approach to, to the caches uh, was present on the um, uh, Oracle or SunSpark T2s. So these were called Niagara processors. The, this, this, this thing's interesting for two reasons. I'll talk about the caches here and I'll talk about the crossbar later. But basically, this again was a multi core system. 
you had your, your individual cores, they had their private L1s as usual, and then they had a partitioned L2. So rather than having kind of a, a single shared L2, they had this partitioned L2 um, where it was split up, and, and so the various partitioned had different address ranges that they were responsible for. And so anytime you're accessing some memory, if it was miss in L1, you would go to the appropriate L2 cache and see if it was there and get it from there and otherwise go up into memory to get it and, and, and bring it back in. And so this is interesting because all the cores had equal access to all of the L2s, so there was this crossbar switch. Um, and so it didn't matter where, which L2 you needed to go to, it was equally quick to get them. But the cool thing about having a partitioned cache is that you could have parallel accesses to the various caches. So if, if one core needed you know, this first L2 cache and another core needed the other one, they could actually independently access those, those caches. And uh, obviously, if they're partitioned, you wouldn't need to keep those L2s coherent, so there was no kind of coherency traffic there. This is interesting because it gives you different trade-offs when you're designing your software in terms of the costs and the penalties that you have for things like um, false sharing or, or cache line bouncing and stuff like that. Right? If, if you've got a cache line in L2 and this processor is accessing it, but that same cache line is, is shared by an independent data structure that this processor is accessing, you're not going to be bouncing that L2 cache line between different processors. It's just going to sit there, and these two processors can access it. Whereas if this was kind of uh, private L2s for each of the cores, right? You notice we have just as many slices of L2s as we do have cores, so these could just as easily be private L2s. That kind of false sharing would be expensive because if this processor needed to access that cache line in its L2 and this processor needed to access that cache line in its L2, then there'd be a whole bunch of coherence traffic bouncing that line back and forth. But with this kind of design, that doesn't necessarily happen. And so the trade-offs, the design trade-offs you make are different depending on what kind of cache hierarchy you have or architecture you have. So that's interesting because that's something you don't often think about. You think, well, cache is cache. It's there. I kind of use the same rules when accessing cache, and everything's good. But actually, if you know more about your hardware, you can kind of optimize it to, be, to work better. So then we have uh, a different option with, um, with the Intel MIC architecture, so multi-integrated core. So this was the kind of Knight's Corner, Knight's Landing, Xeon Phi uh, architecture. So this was an accelerator, essentially. Um, so in this case, again, we'll talk about the interconnect later, but there was a ring architecture. So every core had its own private L2. But essentially, um, it had kind of a virtual L3, where every core had a directory. And that would tell it information about what's in the other L2s. And so if, if you try to access some memory and you miss in your L2, then you could go to the directory and see if any of the other L2s had that address in their cache. And if they did, you could then send them a message to request that and get it back and access it that way. Right? So rather than having kind of an L3 somewhere that everyone could access, it kind of virtually gets made by putting together all the various L2s. And so again, that's another aspect, right? That's actually more expensive than having a dedicated L3 cache because you have to send these messages on the ring and so on. It's more expensive, uh, but you save a whole bunch of space because cache typically takes up the, a large amount of space on your die. So if you save that space, you can have more processors and do more processing. So trade-offs again, but you need to know that as well. right? So if, if you know that actually going to L3 is going to be more expensive, then you can try to organize your, your, your software so that you don't have to do that, potentially. And then there was the Intel single chip cloud, cloud computer. So this is uh, it's an experimental computer or processor. 
And the idea with this processor was to build a many core um, processor using pretty weak cores. So this was you know, built around 2010, and each of the cores were like an original Pentium. So pretty weak for, for those days. But there were a lot of them. This was one of like the, this was like a, a single chip. I think it had like 48 processors or something on it, um, which was one of like the biggest kind of largest core count on a processor for its time. And the idea was that each of these are relatively independent. In particular, there was no hardware cache coherency implemented in this. So rather than spend um, hardware real estate on implementing the hardware cache coherency, they just didn't have any. So they had these, these tiles. Each of the tiles had two processors on it. Um, internally, the processor, the tiles were cache coherent, but externally, they weren't cache coherent. And so it was up to the software running on these tiles on, on, on the SCC to make them the, the tiles cache coherent if they wanted them to be. Uh, but the reason why it's called the single chip cloud computer is that you could also just run each of these independently. So the idea was that you have a single chip, you could run independent instances of the OS on it, independent applications. Each of these could potentially have access to their own independent chunk of memory, and you could treat them as separate computers. Or you could you know, combine some of these together and treat some of them as kind of multi-core computers and separate multi-core computers. It gave you lots of flexibility without kind of forcing everything to be coherent, you get a lot of flexibility for how you structure these things as well as how you structure the software on that. I'll talk about how you might implement cache coherence on these a little bit later when we talk about the interconnects, which we're gonna talk about now. Um, so that was kind of the scale and structure. It's important to know how many processors you have, how they're, organized relative to each other, whether they're heterogeneous, homogeneous. We talked about memory locality. Is memory, does everyone have equal access to memory or is it non-uniform memory access? We've talked about cache, how, how different multi-core processors can implement different aspect, different cache architectures and how that might affect how they perform and how they work. The next big thing we want to talk about is interconnect. So how are all of these cores all of the memories, all of the caches and so on actually connected to each other within the chip or between processors. So we look at the Spark uh, T2, the Niagara again, and this one was interesting because it had this full crossbar switch between the processors and the L2 cache and the memory. And so what that means is that basically every core has a direct connection to each of those L2 caches. So every core has a direct connection to that. And so you've got exactly the same latency no matter which memory you're accessing, no matter which cache you're accessing, uh, which is really cool. Um, it gives you a lot of A, high performance, B, it gives you good determinism. So you don't have to kind of play games with which memory, you know, this kind of non-uniform memory access idea. Um, also, it means that each of the cores, as I mentioned before, have independent access to it, right? It's not a single bus where you're just putting a request on a bus and if everyone's trying to access one of the L2 caches, then you know, they kind of, or, or different, even different L2 caches, they interfere with each other, right? Everyone has their own direct connection. And so you're not kind of limited in, uh, as you are in a bus or in, in a kind of a, uh, a network structure. So that was really cool. That was kind of a really neat feature. Of course, full crossbar switches don't scale very well. So if you want to scale these things to massive numbers of cores, well, that's not going to work very well. And what you end up getting is that your multi-core processors, your multi-kind of package machines start looking more and more like a network. So here's an example of um, an AMD machine where we've got, again, these kind of multi-core dies um, and then multi-packages. And in this case, this had a motherboard and a daughter board as well. Right? So you've got kind of these dies and then packages and then kind of multiple motherboards. And each of these has interconnects between it as well. 
And so you can, if you look at this, you basically see that, well, if you're up in the top left-hand corner and you know, there's different memory, right? So this is also like a NUMA machine. If you need something from the memory in the bottom right-hand corner, well, you're going to have to make a bunch of jumps, right? So unlike in the Niagara case where you had direct access to everything, in this case, you don't. And so you have to make jumps. But they're not, like, it's, it's truly a network structure now where it's not even a uniform network. Right? In this case, this daughter board has kind of you know, these, these cross connections here, whereas you don't here. Right? So from the, for the daughter board to get from the top left to the bottom right is a single hop, whereas on the main board to get from the top left to the bottom right is two hops. And so now, like determining how long it takes to get some memory address means you need to know where on this, on, the, on this computer, the core that you're running on is. Because depending on where it is and where the memory is, it'll take a, a different amount of time, right? The latency is going to be different. Um, so that's interesting, because now you have to really understand the architecture of the, the, the machine you're running on to make decisions about where to place memory, how long it's going to take, and so on. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, so here's an example of, of kind of the latency. So we've got these numbers here. So on a particular core, accessing L1 cache is, let's say, two cycles. L2 is 15 cycles. Then accessing um, L3, 75 cycles. Going to another core is 130 cycles. And then jumping to another processor is a bunch more, like 190 cycles there, 190 here, 260 here, and so on, right? So you've got you know, these different kind of latencies. Um, so as I said, depending on where you are, the latencies are going to be different. But there's something interesting here as well in that in this processor, the routing had a bit of a bug in it. I don't know if anyone can notice what that bug might be. No, um, like that's just a design decision, I think. Um, it's, 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 it's kind of a bug in the routing in, in terms of you'd expect the routing to take the fastest route to get somewhere. But if you kind of extrapolate the numbers, you realize that this is actually too long. It could be done faster. So getting from the top left to the bottom right could actually be done faster than the 369. In particular, it should be 332 because there's this direct link here. But what it seems to be doing is it seems to be jumping up across the top and then down to get there, whereas it could actually have done a faster trip. Um, so that's interesting, and that brings up an interesting point in that now that the interconnects are these networks, now you have a whole bunch of logic to do routing between them. And as we know, like, the more logic you put in something, the more likely it is that it'll have bugs in it. And so now you've got like, potentially bugs in how this communication happens. And so that's something you need to take into account as well. Just from looking at kind of an architecture diagram doesn't necessarily tell you how the thing's going to behave. Right? So you know that you've got kind of where your processors are, or your cores are placed. You even know what the interconnects are between them. But even then, you still can't predict kind of how the latencies are going to be between them. You're actually going to have to measure things on your machine. And so now, you, know, you, you actually have to measure things on the machine to have a model of how it behaves so that you can use that model to actually make decisions on where to place things. It kind of gets worse than that. Um, so this is a, a, a newer system. And these people. We're doing research on, on scheduling, on scheduling threads on multi-core systems and deciding on, you know, depending on what kind of interprocessor communication you might need, what kind of memory you're going to access, where the memory is and so on, deciding where to schedule threads on which processors. And in order to do that, they needed to know kind of what were the latencies and the bandwidths between the various kind of, um, these are nodes. So uh, packages on a processor. 
And so they measured it, and they came up with these crazy results where you've got, you know, some connections between nodes are, are pretty high bandwidth, some connections between nodes are pretty low bandwidth, some connections between nodes are high bandwidth in one direction, lower bandwidth in another direction, some connections between nodes, like the bottom one and the top one here, are unidirectional, where you can only go in the one direction. If you want to go in the other direction, you have to take some other path. Um, and, and so it turns into like this crazy network that uh, if you want to do any kind of efficient scheduling of, um, of threads so that they're relatively close to each other, so that they don't have to spend, you know, so that they get the most optimum kind of communication paths and so on, you have to understand these, these pretty bizarre networks with lots of different kind of inter or different bandwidths and different latencies and so on. That makes it really hard to do that kind of scheduling because you have to, and you have to discover these things dynamically, right? There's no, no kind of um, data sheet that, that tells you this information. So how the interconnectors are, are, are implemented is, gets really complex. Like you can imagine, you know, kind of the hardware or the code, the logic that actually implements this. It gets really complex. And you can imagine that it starts becoming error prone as well. So the other option for interconnects is rather than having you know, these, these kind of crazy network interconnects is to have uh, a mesh interconnect. So the idea with the mesh, this was um, Tylera again. Intel also had Polaris, which was an experimental system in the SCC as well, is that you basically have this, this kind of matrixy mesh between all the processors. And so every processor, every core, is connected to four other cores. Right? You've got above, below, and to the left and to the right. And so now, if you need to communicate with a particular core, it's a slightly easier routing problem where you, know, you kind of follow the mesh to whatever core you're interested in. And obviously, if you're communicating with cores that are further away, you're going to have uh, more hops, so it's going to take longer to get there, as opposed to cores that are close by. But it's a pretty good structure. And uh, pretty predictable as well. Um, a lot of these mesh kind of based processors like the Tylera and so on, they had a number of different network or interconnects as well that were dedicated for specific purposes. So you had, you know, one set of these wires is, is used for the cache coherency pro protocol, right? So the cache coherency traffic goes over a different wire, basically different network than your data. So if you're sending data between these processors, you have a separate network for that. You have a separate network for the cache coherency. Um, there were five different networks. So there's like the user one, um, the tag one, so information about not so much the cache coherency, but where everything is in the caches and stuff like that. Um, various other ones. I don't remember what they were. Um, but the, the point is that this gives you a much more regular kind of approach. And so they really, you know, one, one of the main things that, that Tylera, you know, kind of their main benefit was that they had this, like, really high-performance mesh network. Um, and this ended up being bought by, um, by Mellanox, who were making kind of network, network hardware and so on, and that ended up being bought by NVIDIA. And so presumably some of this hardware, some of these interconnect technologies being used in various kind of processing units and so on, um, you know, that have to do this kind of high performance work, highly parallel work. But this is the idea of, of, of the mesh connection. And yeah, so you save a lot of complexity by having this mesh without needing to directly connect everything to everything else but you get reasonably good performance and you get reasonably good determinism with how long it takes to actually get anywhere. Um, uh, a different approach to an interconnect is to have a ring. So Beehive is an example of an experimental processor from Microsoft from, I think, late 2000s, early 2010. And this provided a, a ring architecture. So you had your various cores, and each core was just connected to its neighbor. And that was in, in a ring architecture. So if you needed to send a message from core 2 to you know, core 5, then 
you would send it to core three, and then to four, and then to five. And so the communication would just go along in this ring. Um, so that was interesting, kind of their interconnect was this ring. But also another interesting aspect of Beehive, like with the SEC, was that there was no hardware cache coherence. So again, there was no kind of each, of, each of these cores had their own caches, but there was no hardware implemented cache coherence between those caches. So if you wanted to do cache coherence, you would need to use kind of the inter-process communication, sending messages between cores to make sure that caches were made in coherent. So you'd have to implement that in software. But again, that way you didn't use up a whole, ch whole bunch of hardware real estate for implementing the, the cache coherence. Um, okay, so back to the, uh, the Xeon Phi, the Knight's Corner, Knight's Landing. Um, they also implemented uh, a ring for this. So I, I mentioned this ring as well. We had each of these cores. We had memory as well. And each of these were stops along the ring. So if you were on a core and you wanted to access some memory, you would send out a message on, or the, the core would send out a message on the ring. It would go to the stop where the memory was located, get the memory, and then send it back. So you had this bidirectional ring. Um, typically, as, as we saw in the, in the Tylera mesh network, there was not just one ring, there were multiple rings. So you had like data rings for sending data, you had address rings for sending addresses for memory you wanted to look up, you had coherence rings for doing the actual cache coherence and so on. So these were cache coherent. So this kind of also built on, uh, on, on this idea of rings and, and kind of, it, it was a product, it was experimental in some ways, um, but it really kind of worked out this idea of using rings as, as your communication mechanism. And then that moved from, from this, this kind of accelerator processor into the mainstream processors. And so we see with, uh, with, uh, with the Haswells, the Intel Haswells, that they introduced these rings instead of these kind of network um, architecture. So if you remember the, the, the previous Intel picture we had with the, with the NUMA machine, it had kind of these interconnects between, between the processors and so on. Um, this is kind of in network interconnect. Now we've got rings, and so each of these kind of things is, is, is a core with its L1 cache, L2 caches, and so on. And then each of these are stops on the rings, and then you also have memory on the rings, and you have I.O. on the rings, and so on. And so if you want to you know, communicate with any of the processors or, or get memory and so on, these would be messages along the rings. Now, the problem is you don't want to make the rings too big because it takes forever then to send messages along the rings. So when you, you know, for, for a little machine, like four to eight cores, you could just have a single ring, um, and that was fine. But as soon as you move to, to more cores, having a single ring was not efficient, and so they started having multiple rings. And so now they had kind of these clusters that were, had their own rings, and so you know, if you were on a processor and you needed to access memory on another ring, you would go on your ring and then you'd have this, um, you know, this kind of jump between rings and, and go to the memory and then back. And that would be faster than having a really long ring that would have to go through all the stops. And then for even more cores, there'd be multiple rings. And even more cores, there'd be three rings and so on. And it would work that way. So that was faster, more efficient to implement than having like these weird complicated networks. The routing was much simpler for those as well. Um, they also introduced um, this cool idea of a cluster on a die. So because they had you know, these, these kind of clusters already uh, with, with their own rings, they made that somewhat configurable. And so you could create these essentially separate processors with access to separate memory on, on the same die. And now you had, this kind of comes from a little bit from that single chip cloud computer idea where you can have like your separate kind of computers, like a cloud computer on a, on a single chip. Now you can have these like separate clusters. And so you can configure your processor to have these separate clusters. So you could say, okay, well, here's one cluster that consists of this ring as well as this, you know, these, this core as well. And that has access to this memory. And so that's one part of the system. And then an independent cluster of these cores has access to this memory. And they work completely independently and, or effectively independently. And so that's interesting, an interesting approach to the structure where the structure is configurable now. 
it's not just one processor, but now you can kind of configure these little clusters. And uh, depending on how you configure them, the, your system characteristics are going to be different. Your latency for accessing memory and so on is going to be different. And then in the most, in, in, in kind of the newest high performance server processors from Intel, Intel starting with the Skylake SP, the rings weren't cutting it anymore. So at some point when you start scaling up more and more and more, the, the individual rings, you don't want a single ring, but having multiple rings with those jumps between rings also started becoming slower and more complicated and so on. And so they went on to a mesh network. So this comes again from some of the experimental work they did. So the kind of the Haswell rings came from the, the work from the Xeon Phi's. Um, this kind of mesh work came from their work on the Intel Polaris architecture. And so you see kind of some of the experimental stuff coming into the mainstream. So now these kind of server processors with a lot of cores have a mesh. Um, so this is similar to what we saw with, with the Tyleras, where now you have kind of this predictable and, uh, and more efficient access to, to the various cores. Um, you don't have to kind of go around this ring. You don't have to have these crazy networks, but you have this kind of more predictable um, access. Um, yeah, so they call them half rings because they kind of just go there. They don't loop around again. Um, so you've got this array of half rings. They use a similar technology. Um, these are used mainly for servers currently, um, I think in some kind of high-end desktop processors as well. So they replace this um, cluster on a die idea with what they call subnuma clustering, which is that you can create these separate memory domains. One of the cool things about this architecture as well is that um, the memory controllers are also basically just stops on the mesh as well. So rather than having a core here, you've got a memory controller here, as well as your inter-socket links. So if you've got multiple processors, these are the links out of there. So they're just regular stops on the mesh as well. So you know how to get them. So it's pretty straightforward to get there. But yeah, you can create these kind of sub-NUMA clusters, which means you can create separate memory domains. So you can say, OK, well, you know, these kind of, this subset of cores is going to be using this memory controller to get access to memory, whereas the, this subset of cores is going to be using this memory controller to get access to memory. And so you have this flexibility. You can kind of flexibly configure the, the processor to have these different NUMA domains. Depending on what your application is going to be, what you need, you can make it seem like separate, um, you know, different kind of processors. Um, the other thing they have is they've got the last level cache sliced over all the cores. Um, so each core has some slice of the last level cache. And then they have a directory-based coherency. So if you need to go to the last level cache and it's not on your local one, you can find out which core does have it and then send messages to get there. Again, you've got these rings that handle the coherency traffic. They handle the data traffic, the addressing traffic, and so on. Um, so again, when you're on a mesh, when you're on a ring, when you're on one of these complex interconnects, whether you're on a crossbar and stuff, all of that changes how your processor works and how you're accessing memory, how the caching works, and so on. So having some idea of what these things are like is going to affect some of the decisions you make on how you're actually going to design your software, how you're going to design your operating system. But also, all of that logic of doing the interconnect, of doing the routing and so on, costs, right? It costs hardware real estate. And that's real estate that you could potentially use for, um, for cores. So there's trade-offs, right? If you want the hardware cache coherence, you're going to need to pay for that by having less cores, for example. And so again, that leads to design decisions like for the FCC, where you don't have um, cache coherence, but you have explicit message passing. So in, in, in other processors, you have message passing through things like interprocessor interrupts, where you can send interrupts to another processor, and then shared memory. Right? You stick something in shared memory, you tell another processor about it, it reads it from shared memory, you've got message passing. 
the SCC, because there's no cache coherence, if you stick something to memory and tell another processor about it, 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 it looks in its memory and it, it gets some other value from its L1 cache that won't work so much. Um, so you have explicit message passing. So what the SCC had was um, this message passing buffer. And so what you could do is you could write some memory into that message passing buffer. And then you could also access the message passing buffer of any other processor. And this is how you could share, you know, kind of exchange messages, right? You could put something in the message passing buffer, um, signal another processor, and it could read that, for example. And so you could directly send messages. And so you could implement cache coherence if you wanted to that way by implementing a, you know, kind of, that's how cache coherence is implemented by sending messages, right? If you put something in your cache, you can send messages to others saying, hey, this has become invalid, right? I have the right value. And you could keep track of what others have in their caches and so on and implement your own cache coherence in software. So you didn't have to waste hardware to implement cache coherence when you could do it in software. And then if you didn't need it, then you could use those cores and that processing for something else. Uh, so that was interesting. Unfortunately, one of, one of the design decisions they made was that actually using this message passing buffer could only be done from kernel mode. And so anytime you wanted to send a message, you, you'd have to trap into kernel mode and, and send the message. And that ended up being quite expensive. Um, so again, there's kind of a benefit to that, but the implementation made it a bit expensive and difficult to use. All right. So that kind of brings me to an end, um, talking about the various hardware. The, the takeaway of that is that, um, well, I guess of, of, of today in general, but of the hardware is that there's this trend to having more and more and more cores in, in your processors. Um, up to many cores, up to hundreds plus cores, but doing so requires very different architecture designs, very different hardware designs. Um, and then also when you're at like hundreds of cores, Amdahl's law really kicks in and you really have to start worrying about this serial, uh, serial sections, right, in your code, the parallelization versus the serialization. Um, you know, when you're, when you're talking about kind of four to eight cores, it's important, but you can kind of get away with, with being a bit sloppy. But if you're talking about hundreds of cores, it's really important, and you really need to take it into account. And now remember that serialization is not just stuff you're doing in your software, but it's all that hardware coherency that's being implemented as well. That is also causing serialization in your system. And sometimes you have less control over that than you do over your own software. So it's really important to understand where the serialization comes from and how it's going to affect you and how you can potentially work around it or avoid it if you need to. Um, heterogeneity. So we've got you know, the NUMA idea, right? Not all memory is equal. Some memory is more expensive to get than other memory. So you need to understand where you're placing memory in order to know how your system's going to perform in order to optimize it and so on. Um, you've got heterogeneous cores. So you've got, for example, the big little, right? You've got powerful cores and weak cores, but also really very different kinds of cores in your SOCs. Um, and so another aspect of heterogeneity is the interconnects for, interconnects, for example, right? Properties of otherwise relatively similar systems can vary widely. So you can have you know, two AMD processors, but they might have very different kind of interconnect architectures and different routing. And so you, know, you think that you, know, you may have a uniform latency between cores on, on, on one processor, but on another processor, that latency may be very different. Right? So you've got heterogeneity in that way to understand that we've got NUMA. Your cache coherency is either going to be expensive to implement or it may not be possible. You may have processors with no cache coherency at all, in which case you can't rely on cache coherency for sharing data, for your shared data structures, for example. So that's something to take into account. Um, but really kind of a big takeaway from this, from looking at all of this hardware, is that computers are a, a distributed system now. Right? It's not just like bunches of computers that form a distributed system anymore. 
but it's within your processor, within your single computer, that you're now dealing with distributed systems, right? We've got routing going on, we've got potential bugs in the routing, we've got different latencies, different bandwidths, different things are far away from each other. Um, even processor can be turned on and off, things can come and go. These are all typical problems that we deal with in distributed systems. And so a lot of, you know, a lot of distributed systems issues like how to do message passing, how to deal with consistency, how to deal with synchronization, how to deal with fault tolerance are now things that your you know, traditionally non-distributed system operating system now needs to deal with as well. So that's stuff we're going to look at uh, next time. So on Thursday, we're going to look at how does all of this inform our design and implementation of a multi-core operating system, right? Thank you very much. Thank you.